All righty, guys. So, all right, let's get started. We have a good presentation today. We're going to have Valero come up. Um, we have three representatives from Valero. Um, I'll let them introduce themselves. And they're going to give a, a kind of presentation, you know, as I said, on the summer internship possibilities at Valero, you know, what they do at Valero uh, and their positions there. So, I'll let them get started. How's it going, guys? Um, my name is Tomas Alvarado. I graduated from UTSA about three and a half years ago. I was sitting right where you guys are. I was a member of the Investment Society. And now I'm a crude oil trading analyst at Valero. Hey, guys. Uh, my name is Bianca Sanchez. I'm a trading Three months ago, I started at Valero. I'm a business analyst engineer, and you've also been training at Valero. Hi, my name is uh, Norbert Castellanos. Uh, I'm a chemical engineer by background with the MIT. I uh, originally worked for Pinzel for nine years, doing a bunch of chemi stuff over there, actual engineering, pro project engineering, process engineering and research engineering for the refineries at Pennzoil. And after working there for nine years, I came over to Valero in uh, 2000. And I've been working for Valero uh, ever since in a lot of different departments. I've done uh, the planning and economics uh, department. I've worked in the uh, business development group. And then most recently I've worked in the marketing side of things and I've marketed uh, asphalt. Uh, that we produce at Valero. I've marketed uh, chemicals that we produce at Valero, like uh, benzene, toluene, xylenes. And I also uh, now market fuel oil for Valero. And the way we're going to break up this presentation, uh, I'm going to go first. I'll give a little bit of intro to Valero. I'm actually going to do a little bit of a an abbreviated class that I do at Valero, where it talks a little bit about the commercial trading floor, both on the crude uh, trading side, and then followed by the uh, products trading side. And then I'm gonna hand it over back to Tomas and you guys are gonna, and they're gonna talk more about the uh, the commercial internship after that. So I'll go first. <clears throat> All right, let's so. First thing I wanted to do uh, for the agenda for today is talk a little bit about the Valero overview, just kind of give you a, a brief overview of what Valero does. Uh, and then I'll I'll jump into the the class I do, which is on the commercial trading floor, uh, basically the uh, the trading for uh, the feedstocks and the products that we produce. And then I'll hand it over to I'll, I'll give a little bit of a brief overview of the refining side. It's a very 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 brief part of it. It's a very technical uh, part of it that uh, we don't cover too much. Um, but then I'll hand it over to, uh, for the uh, commercial intern group to take over after that. And if as, as I'm presenting. You can go ahead and raise your hand, pretend like it's a class, and ask questions. If you, you want to stop and talk a little bit more about what, what I'm covering, that's fine. Or you can wait till after they give their speech on the commercial internship group, and then I'll stay over, they'll stay over, and they can, you can ask us questions after the meeting as well. So either way. All right, a little bit of the Valero overview. Uh, Valero has 15 refineries. And uh, we manufacture gasoline and diesel and jet fuel, stuff you guys are familiar with and you see at our gas stations. Um, then we also have a, a, a big presence in the renewable side as well. We have, I said we have 15 refineries. Uh, we also have, I think 11 ethanol plants that produce ethanol that goes into the gasoline blend that you guys use burning your car. And we also have three large renewable diesel plants at, a, at our uh, Louisiana refinery and a brand new one at our Port Arthur refinery <clears throat> where we produce renewable diesel out of animal fats and animal renderings and cooking oil and any kind of oil, soybean oil, all kinds of, all kinds of plant-based oils. <clears throat> and we make renewable diesel out of it. And then we sell it into markets that require renewable diesel or renewable fuels to burn. We produce, we're the largest, the world's largest independent uh, refiner, which means the uh, 
like guys like Exxon, Chevron, and Shell, those guys, they actually dig oil out of the ground and sell it to the refineries. They also have refineries themselves where they can manufacture fuels as well. Um, but we don't do that. We don't have any equity oil that we dig out of the ground anywhere. We, we never have, and we probably never will. Uh, we're just a manufacturing company. So we buy crude oil from the other guys, that, the bad guys that dig it out of the ground. And the good guys, I guess, we manufacture the products out of, the, out of crude oil that you guys burn in your, your, in your vehicles. So we're the world's largest uh, uh, independent refiner. We're also the second world's largest renewable fuels producer. Uh, what that means is we, we produce uh, the most ethanol, the second most, sorry, we're the second most biggest ethanol producer in the world. So we, we get corn, we bring corn over to our, our ethanol plants, and we ma manufacture ethanol in it. And ethanol eventually goes into 10% of the gasoline blend that you guys burn in your car. When you go to your car, you go fill up in your car, you look at your board while you're filling it up. You can look at the little stickers on there and it says you guys are burning 10% ethanol when you, when, you, when you fill up your car. And the reason we do that is that the federal government requires the sellers of gasoline to blend 10% of their, of their fuel with ethanol in order to make it a clean burning fuel. So when they decided that that was going to be a requirement, Valero went out there and we bought all kinds of ethanol plants to become the second largest ethanol producer in the world. We're also the second largest renewable diesel producer in the world, which is, like I said, we have two, two, plant, two plants in, uh, in Louisiana, one plant in Port Arthur, Texas, where we bring in animal fats, cooking oils, soybean oils, all kinds of oils, and we manufacture actual renewable diesel. And that's normally all marketed out in California, Canada, or the places that have green initiatives to burn clean fuels. We're the second largest producer of renewable diesel in the world. And I need to correct myself, we're the largest renewable uh, producer in the world because we're the second largest of both of those. But in total, we're the, the largest renewable producer in the world. Yo. How much of a the market there is for renewable diesel worldwide? It, it is, uh, we produce 1.6 million gallons a year of renewable. Uh, and since we're the second biggest, I'm assuming we're maybe third or, or a third or a fourth of the market. So it's probably four times that. So I, I'm not sure exactly how big it is, but it's it goes to, okay, I'll tell you where the markets are. California has a LCF, LCFS requirement that requires clean, clean burning fuels. Oregon and, and Washington, they're starting. Canada has their own requirements themselves and they've got a carbon market that allows people to bring in fuels and burn those fuels there at a carbon credit. Europe's got a market as well. We don't market into Europe because they they have more stringent requirements. It kind of protects their uh, local producers of renewable diesel. So it makes it hard for the US to export to, to Europe. And that's about it, right? That's, the, that's about the market for renewable diesel. So I'm guessing it's more like uh, just direct carbon credits then? Correct. Most of it's carbon credits. <clears throat> and the uh, we've also started, we will produce in 2025, by 2025, in this third plant that we built in Port Arthur, Texas, we're going to be producing, I think it's like 500 million gallons a year or something like that of, of uh, jet fuel, uh, sustainable jet fuel, sustain, sustainable aviation fuel is what they call it. And we're in talks to various people about selling that to, for their green initiative. So there's airlines that, that have initiatives that they want to start burning sustainable fuels. And we're in talks with them in anticipation of this production coming online in 2025 to get, to get that sold. What else? All right, that's Valero. We take crude, we manufacture products, and then we market those. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about how we do that on the commercial floor. Commercial floor trading. All right, here's a list of a bunch of crudes that we have a potential to buy. We've fought in the past. We don't we don't buy a whole lot of these anymore. But this is a list of all all kinds of crudes. Okay, and they're scattered throughout the world. What is crude? 
Crude is a black liquid that comes out of the ground. It's extracted out of the ground by the producers. And that crude is a mixture of all kinds of chemicals, all kinds of molecules. It's got gasoline-looking molecules, diesel-looking molecules, asphalt-looking molecules, it's got benzene, it's got butane, all kinds of, it's got some methane in it as well, all kinds of molecules, and it's in this big mixture, okay? That mixture has certain properties, certain qualities, and certain values in them because of what's, what's inside that crude. So when we go out to buy the crudes, you can see all the different names that are listed up on the screen. They, they're usually a description described by the location of where they're extracted, right? So we have Saudi, Saudi Arabian light, Saudi Arabian medium. We've got um, Maya, which comes from Mexico. We've got West Texas intermediate, comes from West Texas. We got all kinds of crudes that, that we buy and they're basically a description based on where they're extracted from the world. <clears throat> And why do we name them? Well, we name them for the same reasons that any other product names itself, right? So in all this, all these uh, presentations, I'm gonna use beer examples. Uh, this, so when you when you go to a bar and you order a Guinness beer, what is it? It's dark, it's bitter, it's thick. When you go to a, a, a bar and you order a, I don't know if you guys drink, because you guys are too young. Uh, if you go to buy a Natty Light, you know what it is? It's light, it's watery, it's distasteful. I don't know. I don't, I don't drink it. Um, but there's expected qualities that you get out of the beer when you buy that beer. Same thing for all these crews. Rather than when we're going out there to buy the crew, rather than say, hey, you know what? I want that crew that's got that's made up of two percent sulfur. It's got a certain amount of nitrogen in it. It's got 40% diesel, 20% gasoline in it, and 10% asphalt in it. Rather than describe it by the properties that you're buying, we can buy it based on the name. We can say we want Saudi Arabian medium crude to come this way. When you when you get offered that crude to purchase, you know exactly what it is. You know the properties of what Saudi Saudi Arabian medium crude looks like because Saudi Arabian medium Arabian crude always looks the same. It's got a 22, 25 density, it's got 2% uh, sulfur in it, it's got 10% asphalt in it. You already know what it what it looks like based on the name. So you don't have to sit there and describe crude by its properties, you can describe it by its name. That's why they're named like that. It's kind of like a brand. All right, when we buy these crudes, like I said up here, the, uh, the crudes have specific densities, which represent the molecules that are within that crude. And the reason we care about that, when we talk about light, medium, and heavy crudes, is what is the light crudes tend to have more valuable products already in them, have more of that yellow part at the top, which is represented, represents gasoline. The middle yellow, orangish part in the middle, that represents how much diesel is in the crude. And then the bottom part of it represents like how much asphalt, tar looking material that's within crude. So if you look at the light stuff, it's already got 60% gasoline and diesel and 30%, 33% asphalt in it. It's gonna be more valuable than, some, than the one that's at the very bottom, which is heavier that has only 14% gasoline, 20% diesel and 63% asphalt. Because what you wanna sell basically is what the market wants. And if you look at the far right, the far right represents the market for our fuels in, in, in the United States. The market wants us to produce 50% gasoline out of, our, of, out of the crudes that we buy. They want us to, to make 30% diesel out of the crudes that, that we buy. So they want us to make 80% fuel that we want to burn out on, on the road, 80% of it. <clears throat> they want a little bit of asphalt. They want a little bit of propane and lighter materials in there, but mostly they want gasoline and diesel and jet fuel. And you look at the crudes, the crudes don't already naturally have that in them, not even the lightest crudes. They only start with 60%. So what does Valero do? Valero operates in the middle, between the barrels and between the market. We're buying crude, which has not enough gasoline and diesel naturally in it. We're extracting gasoline and diesel that's already in it. And then we're converting some of the stuff that's not gasoline and diesel into gasoline and diesel to meet the market demand. That's what the refineries do. And the process and how they do that is complicated and you don't need to know. 
But what we do is we operate in the middle between the producers that, that produce the crude and the, uh, and the market that needs the products. All right, here's another beer example. When we buy crews, we buy it relative to one or a couple, but one of the, there's a major crew that we buy that we reference all our crew purchases about, Brent Crew, which exists in Europe. Brent Crew trades naturally, and it has a, there's a high production amount of bread, so it's heavily traded. It's also paper traded. It's also traded on, on instruments that allow you to hedge and, and, and trade the market for crude in, uh, in general. <clears throat> and when we go out to buy crude, we use, we always reference another crude when we're purchasing it. So if we're buying Saudi Arabia medium crude, we'll say we'll buy it at whatever the rent price is at the time, minus $3. Or if we're going to buy a light crude that, that will be more expensive, we'll say whatever, whatever Brent crude is at that time, we'll, we'll pay that Brent crude price plus $2. So when we're trading crude, we're not trading the absolute price of crude, we're, we're trading the relative price of crude. I'm assuming all these trades are done at OTC? Nope, we buy these face-to-face, -face, talking to customers, right up, right, you know, physical, we trade physical barrels. There's paper trades for crude as well. We don't trade, we we have paper traders that do that on their own, but the, but the, but the crew traders that work on the commercial floor are physically buying crew because we need physical crew to, to run through our refiners. Okay, so my beer example on this one is if you're trying to price your crew relative to a marker, you can do that the same way with a, a basic beer. So let's say the most popular beer today is Modelo Light. If you go to buy a uh, crappy beer, like let's go back to Natty Light, don't tell Natty Light I'm talking shit about it. But if, Natty, if you want to buy some Natty Light, you're going to go there. You're going to go to the grocery store. You're going to see uh, Modelo Light's five bucks, and you're going to go to the Natty Light section. You're like, this better not be one five bucks. The quality of this beer, I expect it to be at least a dollar below whatever Modelo Light is is priced at. And if I'm going to go buy some Shiner Box, nice crew in Texas then you may be willing to pay, pay $2 over for Modelo, over Modelo Light for China Bar. So when you go out to make your crude purchase, you start off with your base value for, for the beer. And then from there, you look at your array of selection and you say, all right, my expectation on quality is, is in my mind and I want it to match with what the market shows. And I'm gonna buy the beers in the order that makes sense. If I'm especially, want a very nice beer, I will pay one or two dollars over, but it's going to be this particular beer because I know it's two dollars better. If I'm willing to, if I'm on a budget, I'm going to buy the cheap beer, it's going to get the job done, and I'm going to pay, expect to pay two dollars under for it, wherever I am, okay? So now you need a GB and you go over to the gas station, the convenience store where you know everything's inflated, and now you look at the Modelo right there and you're like, wait, that's eight bucks? Man, all right, but I'm already here. So I'm going to buy a beer, and I'm looking at Modelo. It's eight bucks. I my expectation is now that all the other beers have not inflated in price relative to that beer that you that beer price that that's at the at the convenience store now. So when the beer price goes up three bucks, just like Brent crude might go up three bucks, your expectation is that everything else should go up three bucks with it. So now I'm out there looking at the Natty Light, and I'm like, yeah, and now I'm willing to pay five bucks for Natty Light because I'm here. It's still you know, three or four bucks below Modelo Light. But now if I'm going to buy Shiner Bob, now I'm not really going to pay up for it. It's going to be eight bucks plus three bucks when I get there, right? Because your expectation for quality is is based on one price and everything else price is relative to that to that marker. Same thing for crudes. When we're out there buying crudes, we have an expected value for all those crudes. And we expect that that price is going to go up and down with relative to that one base crude. We use Brent as our marker. Everything else trades around it. All right. How do we buy it? There's four departments that buy crude for us. There's a planning economics group. That's the group that I said I used to work for, and that's chemical engineers. They run a linear programming model that models our refineries, and it looks at all the feedstock purchases that we have to, that we can buy. All the 
the various pizza that we can buy at Inlands and all the various products that we can make. And it runs a linear programming model to optimize profit, right? With all the variables open that it can choose, it will choose the most optimal fruit slate and the most optimal product slate that it can make. <clears throat> There's a crew trading group. What do the what do the crew trading group do? They're the guys that are buying the physical barrels of fruit, right? They're out there making deals with producers or anybody else that has crew traders that buy crew from the from the national oil companies or whoever that owns crew, and they go out there and they buy that crew, and then they sell it to the refining the refiners. So the crew traders are the guys that are doing the physical deals for crew. Transportation gets involved. They're the guys that got they got to get the crew from wherever it exists over to the refineries. Those guys have uh, looking at the market for freight. So we got to get crude over. We bring it over by ship. We bring it over by rail. We bring it over by barges. We bring it over very in various ways. Sometimes pipelines. <clears throat> they look at all those freight costs and they they plug that information into the linear programming model so that we can make the right decisions. Then there's the crude scheduling group that works with the refineries. That just basically says, all right, if you're gonna if you're gonna consume 100,000 barrels a day of crude, we're gonna be buying you crude in two million barrel lots or 500, 500 million barrel lots. You schedule that around to make sure that it can fit at the refinery on time, in time for you to continue to run. How often do you buy crude? I don't buy crude. I sell my job. How often does Valero buy crude? Yes. Every single day. Every single day we buy two point. Five million barrels a day of crude. We don't buy them all in one day, but we buy on average 2.5 million barrels a day of crude. All right. And we, since crude comes in at somewhere between, you know, barges hold 50, about 50,000 barrels, ships hold 300 to 2 million barrels of crude. We pretty much have to buy crude every single day. So, how much time do you have to figure out what's the price going to be so that you can get a good deal? There's two groups that are going to do it. There's one group that figures it out and one group that doesn't. I'm, I'm going to show you the relationship in one second. And it's related to beer, trust me. The goal, though, when we're buying these crews is to maximize profit, right? So we got all the all the various crews at our disposal. We got we're running a linear programming model trying to figure out which is the most profitable one. And they, the PE group runs that LP and then they work in tandem with, oh, I skipped, I skipped uh, a slide here. The, uh, let me go back to page, this page here, because I want to show you the relationship between the group number one and group number two to answer your question in relation to beer. Okay. If you're, if you are in a social organization, you got a social security. That's that guy over there. Where did you see? There it is. That's social security. He's not buying the beer. But let's say you, your social organization has a budget for beer and you got a guy that's going to go buy the beer. All right. When you guys are about to have a party, you guys figure out, all right, we got $200, whatever, a budget to go buy the beer. I want somebody to go do the beer run for me. Okay. When you go to the market, we want you to do X. Okay. Let's pretend like the Planning and economics group is like the social chair and the crew trader is like the beer runner, okay? The crew, the, the social chair tells the beer runner, you know what, go to them, go to, we're about to have a party, go buy 12 cases of beer. Start off with figuring out what the price is for Modelo Light, start there, that's your base price. Now, if Shinerbach is within $2 of, of, of uh, Modelo Light, buy two of those. If Natty Light is, $4 cheaper than Modelo Light, buy four of those. I mean, we're going to make this budget go long, right? So they give these guys an indication of what they want them to buy based on the relative prices of all these crews. They're not telling you buy, you know, just stick to the menu. They're saying, when you get to the market, you figure it out. You tell us what the most optimal beers that we need to buy. That's the relationship that the planning economic group has with the crew trading group. The P&E group, Gets, runs their LP models, they figure out what the most profitable fruits to buy. They rank them in order in relative values, and then they give it to the crew traders. Now the crew traders go out there, they've made assumptions on what the prices of the fruits are, but they don't know for sure because they haven't made any physical deals yet. When they go out to make those physical deals, that's when they know what the actual price is going to be. 
So they go out there and they say, all right, I'm gonna buy, I'm gonna go try to buy crude at Brent plus two. It's been trading around Brent plus two lately. I don't know, they may be incentivized to discount it to Brent plus $1.50, or it may be get so tight that the price of that particular crude goes to Brent plus two fifty. When they hit the market, they go out there and they try to buy crudes based on all the relative values of all those crudes, just like the beer runner does. It waits till he gets to the market, depending on the prices and the availability of the products that he's trying to buy, he goes and buys them based on the indication of quality that was given to him from the from the PE group or the social chair group. That's that's how it works. So when you ask how long it takes to do that, the guy's working on it all day long. The PE group works all day long just on economics. That's their job. They get price indications for every single crude. They get price indication for any other feedstocks that we buy. They get prod price indications for the products that we're selling, because that's changing every single day. Gasoline prices, diesel prices. Jet fuel prices, they change every single day. And all throughout the day, they're changing as well. So they make some assumptions based on what the prices were given to them at that time. They run, they crank through the model to figure out for each, for, for the 15 refineries that were, that were running. And they tell them, this is the order of the crews that we would like for you to buy for these particular refineries for this particular time frame, based on the information that, that we know at that time. They give them that information every single day. The crew traders run with it every single day. They don't buy all of it every single day. They might buy 5 million in one day, and zero the next, but they buy on average 2.5 million barrels a day of crude every day. Any other questions? All right, I already skipped that. Here's the refinery. Doesn't really matter what's on here. The main, the main thing is that we bring crude in, we run it through a refinery, then we have products that come out. They're on spec gasoline and diesel. They're made in bulk. We fill up huge tanks. And then we distribute those throughout the rest of the, the country, right? We produce, uh, you know, 100, we produce, since we buy 2.5 million barrels a day, of fruit, we're producing 2.5 million a day of our product as well, pretty close to it. All that product gets distributed to the rest of the country or the rest of the world, depending on what, where the markets are. And uh, it's sold, it's distributed out. So from bulk down to smaller sizes, down to terminals, down to the gas station, then you come by. On the product side, we're doing kind of the same thing. We're, we have a peony group that looks at all the ARBs within the country and within the world and tries to figure out where's the best place to put the product. All right. So this particular example, we're trying to look at the market in the in the New York Harbor for gasoline. And we're saying, you know what? We sell gasoline at the gas stations up there. What's the market for, for gasoline on the East Coast? Let's pretend like it's $1.20. Let's look at the market for gasoline in Europe. It's a dollar. What's the price of gasoline in, in the Gulf Coast? It's a dollar. How much does it cost to get over there? Well, there's various costs to get over there. So what the PE group looks at is, all right, given that market is $1.20, where's the most optimal place to supply the product from? In this particular example, it is small snapshot of time, assuming there's an infinite sink that you can send all these products. You would say, I would sell every product, every barrel I had that was produced out of the Europe into the East Coast because it costs me the same in Europe as it does in the Gulf Coast, but it's cheaper to get it there. It's only five cents a gallon to get it from uh, Europe to the Gulf to the East Coast, but it cost me seven or 10 cents a gallon to get it there either by pipeline or, or by ship from the Gulf Coast. Let's send it from Europe. Then the price of in Europe for gasoline goes up to $1.10. Now the pre group, this is pretty simple. I mean, we're just trying to figure out you know, subtraction and, and addition, but the PE group now sends a signal saying, hey, you know what, that ship that was headed there from Europe, it's probably better to ship it somewhere else. And let's supply the East Coast from the Gulf Coast instead because it's cheaper to supply it there. Now, with, now here's the situation. We don't just supply the uh, East Coast with gasoline and diesel. We also supply Florida. So where do we want to supply Florida from? There's a market from the Gulf Coast, or we can supply it from Europe. Then it gets more and more complicated. We have terminals that go all the way up and down 
the Southeast markets. They go up into the middle of the country. We got some in Florida, we got some in Europe. We, we, we supply everywhere in the country. So the p &E group is working constantly with the, with the products group to, to supply those markets in the most optimal way, given limited production, limited demand at those locations, prices that change every single day, logistics that cost different every single day, and, and um, also trying to meet the right qualities for all the different locations that we're, that we're shipping to and lo looking at logistical limitations to get it there. So that's the products trading group side uh, job on their side. And it's kind of the same thing as crude, except for we're going the opposite direction. We have one central location that has a product and it's going to the various markets as opposed to various crude supplies that can go to one refinery. That's it. That's my side. That's an abbreviated version of that class. You have any questions later on about products trading, crude trading? You can talk to me after the class. Right now, I'm going to hand it over to Tomas and Bianca, and they're going to talk about the internship. I meant to move it down. Ships this one instead of that one. Okay, cool. I think it's not. It's not. Good. Yeah, it's showing that up there. No, that's fine. <clears throat> okay, so now we're going to talk a little bit about the commercial internship program. So the commercial supply and trading internship program. It's a 12 week program, it's in the summer, it's heavily project based, uh, and it's just a really great opportunity to network, um, learn about what the oil and gas industry is about, and um, there's a really great mentor leadership as well. Um, <clears throat> and so going into a little bit of what the internship is about. So like I mentioned, it's heavily project based. And as you could see, um, these projects are mainly focused on issues within the company and efficiencies. And so what these projects, um, what the overall goal is, is to provide new opportunities and ways to make uh, these, um, these like efficiencies a lot easier and better. So it's a great way to make an impact. Um, and then some of the project examples, uh, right here we could see like Power BI, um, it's a software that we use and um, like we analyze different supply cost structures for Valero um, and units in Mexico. And then right here also, um, another project was a dynamic pricing model and it was really used to measure the daily uh, US spot market. And then going on to some of the social events. So it's a really fun um, internship as you could see the pictures um, of this past summer. So there's a lot of networking events. There's dinner events. You really get to meet a lot of students from different universities. And like I mentioned, it's a great way to really integrate yourself within Valero and um, network. And um, there's a really cool um, summer, it's a symposium and it's just like this, I think it's like a three day thing. And you get to meet a lot of leaders there. And yes, to the next one. Yeah. And then I'll pass this over to uh, Tomas. OK, so now I know what the internship program is about. What will you actually do? So the way the commercial uh, floor is divided is we're divided into four different departments. The crude oil feedstocks and supply trading, where I currently am now. The product supply and trading, transportation, and wholesale marketing. So the idea is in the internship, you'll get based in one of these apartments. You will be randomly paired with a partner from a different university. You guys will get presented a project. And then throughout your whole internship, you're like slowly working on the project. Every Friday, you present to the vice presidents and other leadership on what progress you have made. And then you'll receive feedback and they like to see how you process that feedback and how you prove in the next week's meeting. So once you go into your full time, because the role of the, the goal of the internship is to eventually get a full time position, 
then you slowly start to rotate between these departments to kind of get more exposure to the different areas so that eventually, you know, once you have your couple of years in, you kind of decide what kind of path you want to create for yourself, what department you want to end up and eventually grow in leadership in that. In my three years, two and a half, three years that I have been there, first, I started in wholesale marketing in the Mexico team. Uh, so as a finance student, how do you fit in? How do you use what you learn here? In there, I was kind of like a jack of all trades because it was a startup business. We started building terminals all over the country. A couple of my assignments, you know, were analyzing our cost structures, you know, what's the most optimal way to get our products into different supply points. You know, we were looking at terminals. Let's say there's a terminal for sale. Then there I go. Yes. A terminal is where you have tanks, you have storage, you store your products, you have a rack, people, distributors, customers, they come, lift the product off the rack, and it's theirs after that. So it's basically just like a supply point. It's a grocery store. It's a gas station for your beer. All right. So anyway, so then they'll be like, right, there's a terminal for sale. Tomas, do an analysis. Do we want it? So then what, what did I do? You know, I went to, within the terminal, do a radius, right? Where would the product from the terminal go to, you know, depending on the cost, how far can you take it? What is the demand? So once you gather the demand, right, you kind of factor in what the price of the product is at that point and what you expect it to be. And then you do your good old discounted cash flow model, right? How much will we make? When will we make, we make money? When will we break even? Just in case, you know, we have to pull out how many years will, will it take for us to break even on that investment? I'm pretty sure you guys have done that type of stuff, right? All right, then I moved over to the crude oil department where I, I've been there for about a year now. I do trading analysis for the crude traders. I'm looking at geopolitical events, market news, not just in the oil energy markets, but in the financial markets. Guess what I do every first Friday of the month? If you took principles of investment with Professor Sweet, I know you're looking at that employment situation report. I look at that too, because guess what? All right, labor market is strong. Maybe inflation is going to go up. Maybe the Fed is going to raise rates again. What does that do to crude prices? It brings it down because people have a, let's say, weaker sentiment on the global economy. What are, you know, what's happening in China? What's happening in Europe? What's happening in Latin America? What is happening um, use price-wise? You know, I look at the charts. You can look at the charts for crude oil, but you can also, there's a market for freight. What's going to happen to freight, you know? So I had to constantly look at trends. How is it associated with other different markets? Is there different ways where you can structure your trade, you know, to where you can optimize and save money and add value to the company? I mean, you're basically there trying to add value to your traders and give them market insights that can help them make better trading decisions. And uh, I don't know if, Bianca, you want to talk about the positions you have had so yes. far? So I have only been in one position I was an ongoing intern. And so another cool thing about um, internship program is if you do get a full-time offer, you're going to go into like a rotation program. So you'll be able to um, try out different positions like a business analyst, a scheduler, trading analyst. So right now I'm still in my first position. I am a demerge analyst. And so um, I'm really right now on the transport um uh, side on Marines. So hopefully I'll be able to do scheduling too. <laughs> so, uh, intern, it's open to how many different majors? So for this internship, we're looking, I mean, if you're in the business school, mm -hmm. like essentially you can apply. I was finance supply chain minor. I mean, we're looking for, if you are accounting and you want to move over to more of a commercial role, mm -hmm. we you can apply if you're supply chain. If you're an engineer, if yes. you are in computer science, uh, data analytics, anything, requirements, we want, we're want. we looking for juniors. If you're a sophomore, it's okay because we'll be recruiting next year as well. So yeah, minimum GPA is a 3.0, uh, graduating between August 2024 and May 2025. I guess the graduation date is the important part. 
-hmm. You can be a senior and graduate like a semester later, still do it. That's what matters. So uh, what kind of individuals are we looking for? Obviously, you got to be able to solve problems. You know, problems arise every single day. Let's say there's a drought in the Panama Canal. Now there's two weeks. It's actually happening right now. There's two week delays. There's people bidding up to $2 million just to get a spot to cross the Panama Canal. What do you do? You know, let's say your shift arrived late. Now you miss your dog space. So now you're going to sit there. You're going to have to be paying the merge by the day. The merge is basically why you, a fee you pay to the ship owner for every day that passes that he's there sitting with your product and not going anywhere because he's losing out on another charter that he could be doing. So problems arise every single day and we have to be quick on our feet and try to problem solve and think of solutions. Initiative, you know, nobody's there at a little holding your hand. You know, you have your basic responsibility but I mean, you can either do your minimum and spend your whole week doing your responsibility, or you can be talking to other people, different teams, see how you can learn, how you can improve, how can you maybe automate some of the models that you have that before were take a long time, you write a macro and then you can do that in like 30 seconds instead. So always looking to learn, always talking to people, uh, you know, don't expect to have your hand held. Uh, results orientation. So we want people to, that like to see how they're impacting the company and the company's bottom line. Interpersonal skills, extremely important. Our, you know, the way, the way we work with the trade floor, it's completely open, different departments all working together at the same time. You have to be able to talk with your coworkers and your counterparts. You know, you have to be able to talk to third party companies, vendors, suppliers, transportation companies uh, and your customers. I had to be talking every day, you know, people in Mexico, Brazil, Colombia, Argentina. And, you know, if you can't be comfortable with that and have the personality where it will make an easier transaction, then it's going to be harder for your job, right? So it's really cool. You just got to be comfortable, go for it and be willing to learn. That's all. Any questions? So how do we apply? So the way you apply, there's a... Did we bring the QR? Yeah. Can we go to Google on here? Yeah. You'll see? Yeah. Yeah. What's the other one, right? So you type in Valero Careers. Um, it's okay, you can just go here. This is the main page. Interns, all right, so our internship program got named Top 100 program in 2024. And then apply now. Go to San Antonio. You don't want to end up in a refinery unless that's what you're going for. And then you have the commercial supply and trading internship program. So right now, today was basically for us to kind of tell you what Valero does, how Valero makes money, what kind of people we're looking for. We're going to have a Valero day next Tuesday or this Tuesday, the 19th from 2 to 5. It's not a, a 2 to 5 thing. You just pop in whenever you can. That's where HR recruiters will be there along with ourselves. And that's where you come, you know, bring your resume, come dress like business casual, tell us about yourself, why you're interested in the company, and then... Hopefully you have applied by then, or if not that week. But we want to encourage people to apply by the 27th because we want to be interviewing the first week so far forward. That's about it. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Uh, what about your next students uh, for MBA? You hired them for the the summer? So sadly, with the visas, because like, to be able to give a sponsorship, you have to explain to the government why you have to take a, a U.S. position and give it to an international student. But for entry positions, it's extremely hard. Uh, but for more manager managerial positions and above, and it's easier to explain the necessity of an international uh, student or person. Anything else? No. 
Okay. Great. Awesome. Thank, Thank you guys for having us. All right. Let's give another quick round of applause to Valero for Shell and I. All right, is that on there? Perfect. So quick items to, to finish out the day here. Um, right now we just went over Valero and now let's do some society updates. So market watch competition. If you guys haven't signed up yet, Feel free to do so now. It's still ongoing. We've been going for a couple of weeks now. Password is investment, you know, but capital I, feel free to scan that QR code, sign in if you haven't already. Competition is still ongoing. You still have a chance to win. There are prizes at the end, so try to do well. All right. All right. Looks like everyone got that now. All right, dues. So um do is our thing, right? You know, uh, we need to we need to make our um, you know we need to make events like this possible. So part of that is within your dues. Uh, twenty five per semester or forty for both semesters if you want to pay ahead, right? Bit of a discount there if you want to pay for two semesters, and they're due by next meeting, right? So end of next meeting, you know, well all of next meeting we'll be collecting dues, and um, feel free, you know, if you want to be a member, if you're really interested, uh, pay dues by then. And then we are doing attendance giveaway raffles at the end of the semester, and there will be three winners for that. So if you attend a lot of meetings, then you have a pretty good chance of winning one of our three $150 gift cards. All right, merch. So we got our society shirts. We're selling them every meeting um, before and after. And then our polos still haven't come in yet. There's a couple of things we're figuring out on that. So just give it a second. We still, uh, we're still figuring out how, uh, when we're gonna get those, uh, but give us a second for that. We have the t-shirts available. Those are $20 and the polos are gonna be $25 when we get them in. All right, big updates here for you guys. Um, Thursday, September 28th in the HEB Student Union, there's gonna be the Accounting, Finance and Economics Job Expo. And above all, Valero is gonna be there, right? Uh, recruiting for, for roles like this. Yes, exactly. Um, on top of that, there's going to be Deloitte, KPMG, the FDIC, the um, the Federal Reserve, S and SWC Investment Services, just to name a few. A lot of different cool employers are going to be there. If you're finance, accounting, or economics, or any other major, and you're interested in any of the companies that are going to be there, um, here's some more information on that. All right, and then we have our calendar. So Alex. All right, guys. So. We have Valero today. Tomorrow we're having a resume workshop. So if you guys want to apply to Valero, go to this uh, resume workshop, get your resume ready to apply. Also for other internships you guys are applying to. Um, all the information is on our Instagram. The room number is there. Um, although the room number might switch, but just if it's, if I, there's no updates on that, it'll be in that same room number. If not, it'll probably be in the FSC. So just keep up to date with what, uh, um, where that room number is going to be. But we have the resume workshop. We're working on a LinkedIn workshop as well. So you also can get polished up your LinkedIn and look professional. Um, we had the job expo the 28th and two other general meetings this month. So we have a lot of events coming up in the following month too. Um, and we have our uh, classes are starting. We're going to be starting in soon, probably in about two weeks. Um, we are working on an analyst program, um, which will help with the sectors overall. It's going to teach the kind of how the Bloomberg work through, how Bloomberg works how you use Bloomberg portfolio and, and uh, different areas within Bloomberg. It's also gonna be a valuation class. It's gonna teach you all the different ways to value company or property using DCF analysis, discounted cash flow. Also, it's gonna teach you, you know, how to use Excel. Excel is probably the most important tool that you use in finance. So you guys really need to know how to use Excel, all the functions within Excel. Um, that class will be teaching that. So there's gonna be more information coming about on that class probably next week. So just keep up to date uh, with our Instagram. Also come to our meetings to find out more about that class. Um, you didn't mention what time the resume workshop. Resume workshops at five o'clock uh, tomorrow. Um, and the room is, I think right now it's 20612, but that might be subject to change. Just keep up to date. Um, any other updates you guys want to add? No? Cool. Well, if you guys have any questions, if you guys do want to network, 
um, with Valero. Come on down, speak to them. If you're a sophomore, even want an internship with them, you know, the following year, come on down to network. It's always good to network and meet new people. So thank you guys.